Uh, George is a professor of clinical psychology here at Teachers College. Uh, he is the director of the Loss, Trauma, and Emotion Lab and director of the Resilience Center for Veterans and Families here at the Teachers College that Jack Highland, the trustee, mentioned earlier today that is, is about one year old, I think, at this point. Uh, his interest center specifically on the question of how human beings cope with loss, trauma, and other forms of extreme adversity, uh, with a particular emphasis on resilience and the salutary role of flexible emotion regulatory processes. His research has been renowned and funded by NIH, by NSF, by the Rockefeller Foundation, by the U.S. Israeli Binational Science Foundation, and has been featured widely in various print television radio media, The New Yorker, uh, Professor Bonanno recently authored The Other Side of Sadness, and he will today speak with us on trauma and human resilience from heterogeneity to flexibility. Please welcome Dr. Benam. Hi, you're still here. Um, thank you for sticking around. I hope this isn't anticlimactic. Um, I'd like to tell you about the research program we do. Um, this, this talk was born out of a, um, a talk I gave at NIH where I was asked to speak to a broad group of biologists and neuroscientists and uh, developmental people and, and psychologists about the research on resilience. And in preparing for that talk, and the talk I gave, I really liked that talk. So I decided to incorporate that more into the, the, my other presentations. So that's what this talk is. This talk will be a lot about this broader concept of what resilience is. So you will have noticed that there are lots of definitions in the literature. And you often hear people say, well, there are all these different definitions. It's not clear which one, if any, are these are correct. But we really need to ask that question. Uh, which is the best definition? Because scientifically, we need to start to parse this apart. What's going on here? The answer is, ironically, that they all are. But not because they're equally viable. Rather, because each captures a piece of a larger whole. Resilience is a very complex, multidimensional phenomenon. It's an umbrella term for a, a whole bunch of elements moving over time. In a recent paper, we call these the temporal elements of psychological resilience. We are trying to put these together in a way that we could um, begin to make some order to this. And we really need to know what these elements are when we talk about resilience. It just doesn't cut it anymore. I mean, the journalists might use the word resilience or newspapers or, or even in, in casual language. But when we say resilience, we, at least in psychology and in science-oriented or psychological science, we need to begin to say what we mean by that term. We need to say which elements we're referring to, how they're defined, and when they occur. So this is a paper, uh, a graph from a paper I did with two master students here, Sarah Romero and Sarah Klein. Sarah Romero has gone on to um, a graduate program at Fordham. And Sarah Klein, I think, is writing a great, the great French novel. I'm not exactly sure. Um, this looks complicated, but this is actually very simple. And the idea was here was to, to just identify the key elements of this phenomenon so that we could understand what we knew and what we didn't know. So I'm going to walk you through this. First, we need time. We can only think about resilience over time. Then we need to ask this very simple question, resilience to what? What is the, the aversive circumstance? So we're generally talking about resilience as something that's difficult. So what, if, what is the aversive circumstance? In psychology, we often talk about these two very broad categories, chronic stressors and acute stressors. Then what is the outcome? So we need to have some measure of resilient outcomes. Uh, and in this case, we'd have some continuum of health to dysfunction. We need to define what that is. And then we can begin to define resilient outcomes. Now, I'll talk about this more in a little bit. If we have these two broad categories of stresses, we actually get different kinds of outcome that we can define as resilience. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a little bit. Then we need to talk about adjustment prior to aversive circumstances. What were people like before the event happened, the baseline level of adjustment? And when we do that, we right away start getting more complicated. There are multiple patterns we might have. And you can see here, if we have two different types of events and two different types of outcomes, we've already got twice as many uh, patterns before the event. 
And then if we follow people over time, which we do in our research and which I'll, I'll tell you about in great detail, then we have multiple different kinds of patterns. So just using these few basic elements, we already have a great deal of complexity, and we spend the rest of our lives, I will probably spend the rest of my life, trying to understand this. Then we have predictors. What predicts these different patterns? And we can measure predictors before, during, and after an aversive circumstance, and it's very important simply that we identify when we're doing that. So what often people ask this question, do we really need to have all this stuff? Um, and I sometimes speak with journalists, and I can tell the, the attention level begins to drop when I start talking about the complexity of the phenomenon. So one shortcut people have tried to take is to develop resilient scales. And I just have to tell you, this is a personal, um, this drives me crazy. Um, and people sometimes call me up and ask me what would I suggest the best resilient scale. And I don't mean to sound critical, but when you say, okay, well, what do these scales actually measure? You can measure anything in psychology and call it something. But what is it actually measuring? So if we look at this level of complexity, and again, this is just a, a, an elementary framework. This is not the whole kit, uh, kit and caboodle. Or this is just the basic structure. Already we have a whole lot of things, many different elements. So what are we measuring with one scale that's called resilience? Often those scales are, are thought to be measures of a kind of a trait, a personality dimension that might be uh, what you'd see in resilient people. But as far as I know, that's actually never been shown with these resilient scales. They've never actually been used as, as predictors of the future. And if they are measuring personality, they're probably only measuring about 10% of the variance. So they're not measuring much of the whole picture. So it's really not appropriate to call those things resilient or a resilient scale. Then we have the question of longitudinal and cross-sectional designs. It's so much harder to follow people over time. But yet, that's what we need. So this was a paper we published in 2004, um, kind of laying out what I thought were the basic trajectories, the basic patterns that, that, uh, that, were in the, uh, that we were seeing. And if this is the resilience trajectory of relatively little impact of a potentially traumatic event. More recently, we've kind of fine-tuned this. And this is a, a better look at what those patterns are like. We've done a lot more research. And you can see the percentages uh, of, uh, of these different patterns. When we first began to do this research, it was kind of assumed that very few people would be down here in the graph, that this is not where people were hanging out after PTE means potentially traumatic event. That very few people would, would experience one of those events and simply not show a lot of symptoms and distress. But in fact, that is the most common response across many, many studies. It's the modal response. When we map these trajectories of outcome, also, there are a whole lot of other questions we can ask, and very few of these questions have actually been asked. A lot of people are not doing well. They don't all simply not do well. Some get better, some get slightly worse, and some um, stay the same. And we know very little about that, because we, it, it takes parsing this kind of data part. Uh, we've done this in, in animals recently. Isaac Gallitzer Levy, where is his name? His name, Isaac Alter Levy, was a doctoral student here, master's student, then a doctoral student. Now he's a professor at NYU in the medical school, and he's doing incredibly wonderful things. This was a study we did with Joe Ledoux and his rodent samples. Um, and this was a fear uh, extinction study. So the acquisition trials, the fear acquisition, was about the same for all the rodents. But then during the extinction phase, they separated out, and we were able to map three different trajectories among those rodents. So rodents extinguishing fear are not the same either. And this makes perfect sense. OK, so we, can, we never use cross-sectional data. Well, sometimes we have really great cross-sectional data, and we want to do something with it. It can tell us things. It can tell us something. This was a study I did with Sandro Galea and his team after 9-11. Sandro was an epidemiologist. He was chair of the Department of Epidemiology up at the School of Public Health for a while. This was earlier in his career, before that happened. He's now since gone on to an administrative position, I think, at Boston University. But he was, was and is a brilliant researcher. And he and his team did an amazing job of collecting a representative sample of New Yorkers after 9-11 at one, four, and six months. So they actually got a sample that matched the New York census, which is no simple feat. So they got this wonderful sample, measured PTSD multiple times, and together, um, I collaborated with analyzing these data. And together, we identified uh, PTSD among the people with different levels of exposure. You can see PTSD, the, the 
uh, enough PTSD to merit the diagnosis varies across these different levels of exposure. Then we identified a group that had two or more but not PTSD, two or more symptoms but not PTSD, and you can see we identified more. And then we identified this group that we were calling the resilient group that had zero or one PTSD symptom. A zero or one symptom um, is a reasonable definition of resilience. Actually, a better definition is zero or two, because up to, up to, people in the normal population have up to two PTSD symptoms at any given time. PTSD symptoms are just problems. They're, not, they're nothing more mysterious than that. We call them symptoms, and they have this flavor of you have a symptom means you have a piece of a disease, but it's really just a problem. And a, a lot of problems in a certain area gives you something that we call a disorder, but symptoms are problems. So this was defensible. We were conservative here, saying zero to one, and we got a lot of miles out of this. We learned a lot about how 9-11 affected people, et cetera. But there's a major limitation to doing this. Even though we did this study, even though my name is on this study, and even though we are proud of what we did and not much had been done yet on 9-11, there's a real flaw in this kind of analysis, and this is why. We love normality. We like our data to be normal, and we assume that our data should be normal, then this nice bell curve. And most of our conventional statistical techniques require normality. And as some of you know, if you've had non-normal data, you do something to it to make it normal. But that's actually, you're losing information. It turns out when you have something like post-traumatic stress, it's never normally distributed. In fact, almost anything you measure after a major adverse event will not be normally distributed. That's not really well known, partly because if you're just studying psychopathology or PTSD or something at the end of that, that distribution, it doesn't matter where, where, um, what the rest of the distribution is because you only want to know about those people at the end. But we're trying to understand resilience. So we're trying to figure out where we can parse this, this distribution so we can understand who's exceptional or who's doing really well and who's struggling a little bit more. But you can see by where I just put that line that it doesn't really matter where it goes. It's not clear. There's no real obvious way any, any obvious place to put that line. So that's a big problem if we want to understand resilience. So we have this question, what's inside this distribution? These are six distributions, six different types of events using different outcome measures. And you can see they all have that positive skew. There's something else you can see in these distributions. They're bumpy and they're, they're multinomial. That suggests that there are groups embedded in there. They're latent groups. So here's one from a study we did of uh, PTSD symptoms one month after emergency surgery for traumatic injury. This very scary event. It's not normally distributed. It was, it was uh, positively skewed. And you can see that there are probably subgroups within that distribution. So now we have ways to, to um, we, we've been trying for years to understand these things. And now, because of the, 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 uh, the memory capacity we have now and just even our desktop computers and the software that people have developed to utilize that capacity, we can do interesting analyses. One of the ones we do a lot in my lab is called latent growth mixture modeling. Mixture means unique normal distributions within a non-normal distribution. So we can identify these normal distributions as they're embedded in a non-normal distribution. And latent and growth simply mean trajectories over time that we, that we don't see right away, they're latent. And they look something like this when we're following these distributions over time. People are clustering into these normal distributions embedded within the, in the broader non-normal distribution. So to show you how we do this, this is something called the German panel data set. This is a national data set. There are lots of these kinds of national data sets out there where you can get access to them. The German government follows thousands of people who volunteer to be in the studies, follows them over many years, and then the data are made publicly available. This particular study was done by Andrew Clark uh, and Ed Diener and their colleagues published in the Economic Journal. And in this particular study, they followed about 17,000 people um, for 19 years. And they were interested in how life satisfaction varied in the years before and after these events. And you can see their graphs there. These are based on averages. Averages don't tell us much at all. Uh, averages kind of mask interesting findings. So we reanalyzed these data with latent growth mixture modeling to try to understand what was in the data. So this is the findings for widowhood, the death of a spouse. This looks about what you would expect. Uh, the year before the spouse dies, life satisfaction begins to drop. It reaches its nadir the year the spouse died, and then it kind of goes back up. We reanalyzed these data with Andrew Clark, one of the original authors. That's because just because the data set is publicly available, 
doesn't mean you can figure it out. It's really hard to understand some of these data sets. So we collaborated with Andrew. Um, and um, we reanalyzed these data, and we found that there were four latent groups. There were four trajectories embedded in these data that better explain the data. We have fit statistics that tell us this is what explains the data. 21% of the samples showed that pattern that looks like the average, although you'll notice that they didn't go back to baseline. So that's really kind of a complicated grief reaction. That's a sort of a, a, a dysfunctional grief reaction. Those people are suffering. Their life satisfaction didn't go back up. At the same time, though, we found more than half, 58.7%, almost 60%, showed pretty much stable high life satisfaction throughout the study. So this is our resilient group. They're not showing any major impact. It's not that they don't care, but they're not showing any major impact of the loss. And then we had these other groups. Now, we, in my lab and in my research, we tend to look at how people cope with more extreme events, or with, with extreme events, so we, we did this study using using the same approach to study traumatic injury. So this is 330 men and women who had a single incident, incident traumatic injury, like a motor vehicle crash or fall or gunshot. And they were in, taken to a level one trauma center, and they required emergency surgery. So this is a very scary event. They got up that day not thinking this was in the cards, and they're in an ambulance probably and requiring emergency surgery. So this is scary. We had PTSD and depression measured in the hospital, and then one, three, and six months. And the fact that we had PTSD measured in the hospital was very important because it meant we could really get at the, the, what that trajectory looked like right from the beginning. That was a question that we couldn't always easily answer. These are the trajectories we found when we did the mixture modeling analysis. 21% of the sample showed chronically elevated post-traumatic stress symptoms. That's a lot. That's more than one in five. It's more than one in five people showing what's essentially chronic PTSD. Despite that, we still had over 60% who had essentially no symptoms at all. They're right at the bottom. So we still had this resilient group. Same type of event, same um, study, and yet we had this widely dis disparate responses. This was, a, in, in my mind, as kind of more impressive data even. This is a spinal cord study I did with um, these wonderful colleagues in Europe, Paul Kennedy at Oxford, uh, Isaac Altolivi uh, was again involved in this, and Peter Lude and Mangus Elfstrom from Switzerland and uh, Sweden. And um, spinal cord injury, thankfully, is not so common. So this was a six, a multi-site study, and um, from all these different sites, we had enough data to, to do a reasonable analysis. The data were collected in the hospital again, soon after the injury. Again, that's really important. And had three months, 12 months, and, uh, and two years. These are what the data look like. You can see there's a lot of depression in this sample. This is depression. Spinal cord injury is essentially three um, negative events in one. First, you have a traumatic injury serious enough to lesion or sever the spine. Then you have, the, have to come to terms with the realization as the patient that you've probably lost bodily functioning forever, depending on how high up the injury goes. And then there's a long period of rehabilitation. So this is a life-changing event. There's a lot of depression, but you'll notice that we had our resilient trajectory again, uh, about 53%. But what really stands out here is despite the severity of that event, they're right at the line. That dashed line is the population norm for depression. That's the population. That's like anybody else on the street, and they're almost indistinguishable as a group. Their mean laid right on the group, on the, the population norm for depression. They were not any more depressed than anyone else on the street right even in the hospital. These are the same participants uh, with anxiety. It's slightly more anxiety, but it's still well within the normal range. So they were, that was, again, a resilient group. And that was close to 60% who had no anxiety, even in the hospital. Um, forgive the tininess of the text here. This slide um, shows a select list of the studies we've done and other people have done in the last five years. A lot of people are using these techniques now. What's impressive about this is all these studies you can see for lots of different uh, events, mass shooting, heart attack, hurricane disaster, lots of nasty stuff. And resilience is always the majority and always pretty high at 60, 70, 80%. What's particularly impressive about all this data, a lot of the, the, the studies with the Aster come out of our lab um, but the other investigators sometimes use different approaches. They use slightly different methodologies, and there's a lot of variation in how people are using these techniques. So we, a lot of different people keep getting these same types of findings now. <laughs>
I'm kind of whipping through this stuff, but I hope that's OK. So far, you look, you're not fainting or anything or falling asleep. Um, now, uh, earlier on when I was doing this, I was presenting this work a lot with, uh, on panels with developmental psychologists. And that was a really bizarre experience. Because developmental people have been studying resilience for a long time, before I came on the scene, actually. It would be much before trauma researchers were. And sometimes I'd be on these panels, and people would say, you know, you're wrong. What, this, what you're doing is wrong. We've been doing this before you, and you're wrong. And your trajectories are wrong. And then I would say, no, your trajectories are wrong. And as you can imagine, we didn't get very far with that kind of dialogue. So I've been thinking about this. And I've made some friends, some good friends with some of the developmental people. And I've tried to understand it. And I've, um, I've finally be begun to understand why we get these differences. And it has to do with the stressor type. This was a paper I did with Erica Dimenich, who was a doctoral student. She's now gone on to NYU also in psychiatry. She's on, working with schizophrenia right now at NYU, doing really great research. But we had published this paper a couple years ago, and we'd argued for that we need actually two different, there are two different kinds of resilience depending on the event. So I want to take a minute to tell you about that. Pretty much everything I've showed you so far, we're now calling minimal impact resilience. That's when you have an isolated normal circumstance occurring in otherwise, isolated event occurring in otherwise normal circumstance. You get up in the morning, you don't expect something to happen, and everything else is more or less OK. And then resilience is a minimal response or rapid return to baseline. And a minimal impact resilience looks something like this. The potential traumatic event doesn't last very long. And its reper repercussions may last well, but the event itself doesn't last very long. And then you have this pattern of pretty much uh, stable health, stable good health afterwards. We call that minimal impact resilience. In the child development literature, however, they tend not to study those kinds of events. I'm, I'm slow. It took me a long time. Unlike uh, Xiaodong Lin had described, I struggled with this for a long time. And I finally began to understand it. We're, what, what is studied often in a child development literature is emergent resilience. And typically, what's studied is a pervasive and enduring aversive circumstances, like poverty or chronic abuse, civil war. And resilience, in this case, looks like a, uh, it, it is a gradually emergent phenomenon when that stressor uh, it disappears. So chronically aversive circumstances take place by definition over a longer period of time. And you see something more like that. You don't see perfect health often in these cases, in, these, in this context, because we're not designed for chronic adversity. And we wear out our biological stress response. It's very effective stress response, but it's designed for acute stressors. It's not, we're not wired, we're not, I'm, I'm using these words loosely, wired is a little funky word, but we're, we're, we're not, um, and there is no word, as soon as I try to find one, I'm, I'm not going to have anything, but I'll just use wired. We're not wired to endure things for months or even years, and when we do that, the stress response equipment we have begins to break down, so we get symptoms. So there are people who are struggling, but then when that aversive circumstance eventually goes away, they move into the normal range, and we call that emergent resilience. And this is what you see in the developmental literatures. So you can see how confusing this would be if you have adults showing this pattern and children showing that pattern. You can see that emergent resilience looks a lot like what we call recovery in the adult literature. And it just so happens that these literatures are confounded with acute and chronic stress. Now, the more I've looked into this, and I've seen other studies afterwards, and people now send me studies since we've been publishing this, I think it has less to do with adult and child subjects or literatures and more to do with just the acute, acute chronic stressor distinction. Because there are studies that cross those paths. Adult researchers rarely study chronic adversity. Child development researchers rarely, not exclusively, but rarely study acute life events. Here's a study. Um, my colleagues in Australia did Robin LeBrock and Paul Canardi, and they did an emergency room study in Australia and when children were sent to a pediatric ER, and they found the minimal impact pattern in children around the same prevalence. This is a study I was involved in with Stephen Hoppel's group. They did a study of the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza Strip during the Second Intifada in the mid-2000s. And there, this was a population study that did an amazing job of getting these data. I have no idea how they actually pulled this off. They also had exposure measures. And it was just basically the, the, the phrases we used in that paper was mass casualty and cr chronic political violence. There was just enormous amounts of exposure to adversity in the study. And we didn't see the minimal impact pattern. 
It wasn't in the data. I did this analysis of the mixture model. Instead, we found these trajectories, which look like they're going toward the emergent trajectory. So when you, when you do have chronic adversity in adults or children, you tend not to get the minimal impact pattern. When you have acute adversity in children or adults, you tend to get the minimal impact pattern as the resilient response. What about baseline data? And this is one that we often hear, well, in the trauma world, because traumas by definition are unexpected. Well, you can't really get that kind of data, but we can. We, it's, it's a lot of work. I always think of if, if physicists all said, um, you know, well, Newton Newtonian physics is fine. The other stuff's too hard. That we wouldn't have satellites. We wouldn't have cell phones because we need, we need, we need, um, uh, we need quantum theory and other kinds of physics for that kind of stuff. So this is a Breedman study we did. It published this in 2002. I was very proud of this study at the time because this was the first, as far as I know, this was the first prospective Breedman study ever done. So this is when I was, we had data well before the loss and well afterwards. And it was not easy to get this data, um, but we have this data for uh, my colleagues collected the data and I collaborated on this project. So if we just have the data after the loss, we get the same three patterns you're, you should be getting used to now, resilience, recovery, and chronic grief, in this case, the chronicity pattern. When we have the pre-loss data, however, we get different patterns. We get much more complicated patterns. For example, there was a pre-existing chronic depression pattern that emerged. Not surprising, but there were people who were depressed before the loss. Without the pre-loss data, though, we wouldn't have known the difference. And in fact, it turns out we've done a few papers showing that these are these are very different groups, and they're predicted by very different things. And a lot of what people used to think predicted chronic grief was actually, were actually the things that predict chronic depression. And then we found this group uh, we called depressed and proved. They were depressed before their spouse died, and then they moved into the normal range when their spouse died. Now, it looks like they are thrilled that their spouse died, I know. But that's not what's going on. What's happening is they, they were very depressed, and the depression went away because it was the end of a stressor. And you can probably guess this group was caregiving, and caregiving is super stressful. But we've now seen this, this same pattern in seven or eight studies, different studies, and it's not so, always so easy to explain. But again, you can't see the difference between those two groups if you don't have the pre-loss data, if you don't have the baseline data. And they're very, very different groups. And, and, and if we're doing any kind of intervention or action with people, we need to know who we're, we're talking about. Now, this was a study. This was a fantastic study. I was lucky to get involved in this later in the game, but this is a study called the Millennium Cohort Study, begun in the year 2000. It involves 140,000 soldiers who have been followed, or being followed for, I think it's up to about 140,000, and the goal is to follow them for 21 years. So I was, um, it's a little bit ambulance chasing, but I was drooling when I heard about this study. And um, so I, I collaborated with the investigators. And this is the data on PTSD symptoms before deployment, then three years later and three years later. 6.7% um, showed like a PTSD reaction. They, their elevated PTSD symptoms didn't go away. That's much lower than you'll hear about in other studies. The reason is because there's no sampling bias. There's a captured sample before they go to war, and there's now been several other studies just like this, and they find the same rate. So this is the much more accurate. That's the psychological cost of war, Six, around 7%. That's much more accurate. We were also able to, to separate them out, and that number reflects the fact that we parsed out people who had pre-existing elevated symptoms. It's only about 2%, 2.2%, but the military is large. So we were able to separate those two groups out. The other big finding here is that 83% of soldiers deployed in Afghanistan and Iraq showed this resilient pattern, essentially no symptoms. That's much higher than we even thought we'd find, but it's 83%. It's very high. But we were also able to separate that pattern out from another pattern of people who were kind of struggling and it kind of got better. Um, and without the pre-loss, without the pre-deployment uh, data, we might not have seen that difference. Now, the trauma world is not free of politics. You may or may not be surprised to know that or to hear that. I felt like I was really naive when I, when I first did this study because I thought everybody would just love it. And it turns out there, there are a lot of politics to PTSD. And I won't tell you what the politics are about, but I'll leave you to your imagination. So not everybody was thrilled to see these findings. And people dismissed these findings. One of the things people said, I actually heard somebody say, well, the reason they got so little PTSD and so much resilience is because they had everybody. 
And when I heard that, I said, well, yeah, that was the point. Because now we have the population. So this is a more accurate estimate. The other, so that's easily dismissed. The other, though, more, slightly more serious issue or more viable criticism is that probably people said, well, probably we didn't have enough combat exposure in these people. Now, this is a huge sample of people that we took from, we sampled from, but it's, it's not a completely invalid criticism. And in fact, the resilient group had less combat exposure than the other groups. So we wanted to address that problem. So recently, we did another study. This one isn't published yet. It takes a long time to publish military studies. Um, and we did what's called a known class analysis. We did the mixture modeling on two different groups. One group who had no combat exposure but were deployed, and another group who was deployed and had significant combat exposure. And I've, I've laid them on top of each other. There was a difference, but there were small differences. Here you can see each one of those groups had a resilient trajectory that emerged. But they are very similar. The group on the top, whoops, the group on the top um, was the group that had significant combat exposure. They still had almost 81% resilience. So most 81% of the soldiers who had significant combat exposure were still resilient. The group that had less combat, that had no combat exposure, had a higher level of resilience. So there's a difference, but it's a relatively small difference. The most interesting finding here was the group that was doing poorly before they went to war. And you can see the red bar that I just put up there is a group that had combat exposure. So if people were doing poorly before they went to war, they continue to do poorly, or as if they did not have combat exposure, they were deployed but didn't have significant combat exposure, they got better. So that's an important thing to know. I'm not involved, I'm not in the military, and it's not my business what they do with this, but there it is. This was a study um, Isaac Gallitzer Levy and I did on heart attacks, and we wanted to know about mortality in heart attacks. There's been a, an emergent finding that people who are depressed when they have a heart attack, or who are, depression and heart attacks don't go well, and people die more quickly when they're depressed after a heart attack. That's very serious. It's something we really want to know about. So in this particular study, we tried to ask that question, when does that happen? And nobody, we didn't know the answer. Nobody knew the answer. Is it people who were depressed and had a heart attack? In which case, you'd want to know uh, you'd want to be on top of that to try to intervene, or that people become depressed when the heart attack happens, and nobody knew the answer. So we were able to actually to find out by doing these trajectory models, and it turned out it was the people who had the new onset depression who were more likely to die, not the people who had the pre-existing depression. Very important stuff to know, because the interventions can now be targeted for that group. Predictors. Um, why are most people resilient, but why isn't everybody resilient? Um, that's a really interesting question, because if it's, if it's kind of innate, shouldn't everybody be resilient? Or most people be resilient? It's a really super interesting question. I'm going to fly through this just because I'm just going to put pictures of brainy type body things up here to show you. And I, I, I like to talk about this and walk people through it, but I think there's just not enough time uh, for this talk. Um, but the crux of these slides are that we have a fantastic stress response system. It's, it's phylogenetically, phylogenetically ancient. It's, we see similar stress response system. I was quoted in a German magazine in German saying that humans are like squirrels, I think. And I, I don't speak German, so I asked a friend to decode it, and they said, did you say that? And I, I thought, I don't know, I don't remember saying that, but I think what I was saying was that we have very similar, some of the very same brain structures that you might see in a squirrel or also in humans, but then we have this wonderful cort cortical regions on top. But all of this stuff gives us a lot of flexibility for dealing with stress. It's a very, very powerful and flexible stress response system, but it also gets in the way sometimes. We can turn on our stress response in the absence of danger. We can all do that, and we do that sometimes. Or we can exaggerate a stress response. We can exaggerate the danger because of the top-down processing we have gets us into trouble. It also requires a lengthy period of development. All this fine equipment takes about 25 years to fully mature. So there's a lot that can happen in those 25 years. And there's a lot that can happen with such complex machinery. And for that reason, we need their other factors come into play. That's why predictors do matter. And that's why it seems like it's innate, but yet there's a lot of variability. We tend to think of these predictors as being kind of a few basic things that we're going to slice up with nice, big, fat, Sicilian slices of pie. But in fact, we got like the, the dollar slices here instead. Um, 
there are lots and lots of predictors, all with small effects. No one thing does much. And it means it's multiply determined. That's basically what it means. There are many different ways and many different factors that, that contribute to resilience. Um, we see factors that occur before the event, factors during the event, and factors afterwards by these three different colors. I've already told you about exposure. I, don't want to, I won't go into that much more. Um, I don't have time to go through all these. But there are lots of interesting things that come into play, including genetics, lots of interesting stuff. But there is one thing that I'd like to talk about just briefly, and that's personality, because we are all psychologists, and we love personality. Personality are small effects. Again, as Walter Michel, our colleague across the street, made famous in 68 by, say, by making that point. Personality doesn't explain that much variance, but it's still cool. It's still interesting, and it does explain some of the variance. So I, one, of, one of the ones, I've looked at a lot of different personality measures, and optimism is probably the more, one of the more robust, and it's very interesting. It's essentially expecting something positive in the future when there's no particular evidence for that. So it's a bias, a positive bias, an optimistic bias. And there's, good, there's lots of good um, convergent data. Optimistic people are healthier because they tend to take care of themselves because they think it's worth taking care of themselves. And there's good neural evidence, Liz Phelps lab, downtown has shown some nice uh, uh, fMRI data showing what optimism looks like. So there, there are people who are more optimistic than others. In this heart attack study that I showed you earlier, we looked at optimism, uh, because this is a population data, we looked at optimism measured by these various sort of predictive variables about the future. We measured it four years before the heart attack because it was in these data. And a lot of them had to do with income, so we controlled for income. Whoops. And we found that the, the people who were the most optimistic tended to be in this group. They were healthy, and they stayed healthy even when they had a heart attack. So they didn't get depressed. The optimism seemed to be a buffer there. And this is pretty strong data. that It actually has a buffering effect because it's prospective. Uh, coping and appraisal. Um, there's some interesting things here. One of them, this is the spinal cord study I showed you earlier. One of the interesting things here is what's called threat and challenge. You can measure how people respond to threats as either a, a, the pending threat as either a threat response where they focus primarily on how bad it's going to be, or a challenge response where they look at how, how, um, how they can respond to the threat. And you can do this. Lots has been done. Lots of studies have been done experimentally with physiology and people who make challenge appraisals when they think, what is happening to me? What do I need to do? How can I respond? those people have more adaptive physiological responses than people who focus only on threat. And in this spinal cord study, we found that the people who interpreted the spinal cord in terms of challenges, what do I need to do? I didn't want this to happen, but it happened, and I, I need to move on with my life. What do I need to do? Those people were more likely to be in that resilient group. The last thing I want to tell you about, I'm pretty sure I left myself enough time, is what we do a lot of in my lab right now called regulatory flexibility. We're very interested in this. We've been doing this for about 10 years. And I'm, I'm totally um, taken by this stuff. This is what we do a lot of now. Um, a couple years ago, Chuck Burton and I uh, wrote this paper. Chuck was a doctoral student then. He just recently finished up. And he's gone on to Yale now to uh, do a postdoc at Yale. Very, very bright guy. Um, we took what we've done in the last 10 years and what other people have done and put it into this model to guide future research. And we're doing a lot of this now. So this is the basic idea. You all know about theories of coping and emotion regulation. These are dynamic theories. They're about what a person's doing and what, how it fits with the changing demands of the environment. So it's about the person's situation interaction. These are old social psychology terms. But it's really about what, we, what the environment is bringing to us, the challenges and threats and how we respond and how we adapt to that changing, um, that changing environment, those changing stressors. And that's really what coping and emotion regulation theory are about. What's fascinating in this area, though, is that in practice, we've tended toward these very static models. I think this is largely because of self-report questionnaires. But we tended to this static categorization of coping and emotion regulation behaviors as either adaptive or maladaptive. Like it's adaptive to find meaning. It's maladaptive to avoid or suppress. And that kind of lore has built up. But in fact, there isn't that much evidence to support that idea. So we call that the fallacy of uniform efficacy. It's really method bound. So certain types of, of measures show this certain process to be maladaptive, but other types of measures don't. So there's enough evidence to suggest that there's much more, it's more dynamic as the theory suggests, and that this, or this, this is a, a, a fallacy. 
So I like to look at this, if we look at this in nature, in cost and benefits in nature, there's no such thing as a perfect adaptation. No, no, no adaptation that occurs through evolutionary development is perfect. Every adaptation is both cost and benefits. And I love the peacock's tail. Now, some of you have seen me talk before. No, I always show these slides. There are two peacocks down the street. I'm sure most of you know at St. John the Divine. They're amazing peacocks. The males, the peacock. And they, this tail is, um, only the males have this tail. And it has really one purpose. It's to, it's to um, get eggs laid. That's the best way to put it. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it's just about the most fantastic adaptation. Wouldn't you like to have one? <laughs> you go in a bar, just <laughs> that's, that's all you have to do? Well, I guess we do have like Tinder now and stuff like that, so I guess it's, it's not that much different. So somebody's just put a peacock's tail on Tinder, I don't know. Um, but it's, very, it's an evolutionary adaptation for that reason, for sexual selection. And it's extremely effective. But it's not perfect. It has a cost. And the cost is it's big and it's a tail. And these are birds that fly. And they have meat on them. They're big birds. And if you, ever, if you get a chance, go to St. John the Divine. Try to approach those peacocks. They do not like it. And that's because they know they're vulnerable. They really make a big deal about it if you try to approach them. The other good example is the cheetah's speed. The cheetah are ostensibly the fastest creatures on Earth. They're beautiful. They have teeth and claws, and they're meat eaters. So if you're going to come back or you know, be incarnated or whatever you want, however you want to think about this, as, a, as an animal, as a creature, this would not be a bad choice, right? Because if you're, you're, a, you're a meat eater and you can just run out and get whatever food you want. But it's not perfect either. The cheetah actually can starve because the cost of speed is stamina. They, and I think it has something to do with fat. Somebody told me it has something to do with fat metabolism. But they don't have stamina. Anything that's fast, like Usain Bolt, the, the, the fastest man on earth, I think, still, does not run marathons. Because he, why does he not run marathons? Because he would lose. Because he's not, he's not trained and built for, for, for distance. So cheetah, the creatures that, that cheetah like to eat have evolved strategies to buy themselves a little time, and then they can outrun the cheetah. So we get back to human beings. And we know that we have all these different types of stressor situations that we're confronted with. Hurricanes, terrorist attacks. Abuse, loss, medical emergency, the New York subway, anything that we have to deal with, right? And, and what works in one situation is not necessarily going to work in another. It may even be maladaptive in another. So to begin to make sense of this, we've been doing a lot of research on this, and this is what we've been finding. So we put it into this model now. And I can't tell you about the individual experiments and the data we've done because it's just not enough time. But I want to show you the model. So we're regulating ourselves. You're all regulating yourselves now. Barely, you're, 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 you know, you're, you're fading. But then something major happens. And when that happens, whether we realize it or not, we evaluate the demands and opportunities. We ask ourselves, what's happening to me? What do I need to do? And typically, we don't know we're doing this. We do this kind of implicitly. But with that information is really important. Our assessment of what's happening to us, whether we know it or not, is what we use to decide how to respond. But not everybody does that with equal dexterity, equal acumen. And that's what our research is showing. So we call this context sensitivity. Some people are more sensitive to contextual cues and demands than others. And those people tend to adapt better. We use this information, as I said, to select a regulatory strategy. But then another individual difference is the fact that not everybody does everything with equal skill. So we have to ask ourselves not only what do I need to do, what am I able to do? And again, we are able to measure individual differences here. We call that repertoire. And then finally, we choose a strategy. We enact it. And then the, the thing that we're studying now uh, a great deal that hasn't been studied much is a third phase where we ask ourselves, is this working? Because in the real world, outside the laboratory, in the laboratory, we tend to study one kind of emotion regulation or something. And we find what its consequences are, and we're done. But in the real world, we try to regulate ourselves a certain way. And we, we, we ask ourselves, is it working? Is this doing what I need it to do? And again, we find individual difference in that ability. We call that feedback. For, that was a, I think it was a lousy name, but we're stuck with it now. Um, and um, we use that information to either continue doing what we're doing, adjust it to maybe select a newer strategy, or rethink the whole situation. 
And then we, if it's a major stressor event, we're going to cycle through this many times. So I'm very excited about this stuff for several reasons. One, we've got a lot of data, and we're doing a lot of research now on each of these three components. We've got laboratory studies. We've got self-report measures, so we can use them in large sample in large survey studies. And the measurement's coming out really nicely, and we're asking a lot of really interesting questions right now. Um, and it seems another reason I'm excited about this is this might be something we can teach people, or might be something we can use in, in, in an intervention, not just for trauma, but for just everyday life. And I've never done that kind of work before, intervention work, but I'm very interested in this possibility. The other thing is that there's, this fits into a broader picture that I don't, I don't, I don't have answers to that yet, but it, and I'm just speculating here, but this is very interesting. We tend to think of flexibility as a moderator between acute stress and resilient outcomes. So flexibility, there's an acute stress, there are more flexible people are able to cope better and more, to be resilient. But where does our flexibility, where do we, how do we become flexible? And I think that's where we can start thinking about how this fits in a lifespan perspective with early life adversity. And then we get some sort of mediational effect. For example, work uh, by Nim Tottingham, who's across the street in, in the psychology department, and a few other people have been looking at how um, we regulate the amygdala, our threat response. Amygdala is involved in the threat response. And we tend to regulate that with the ventral medial prefrontal cortex uh, in, the, in the, the frontal part of our brain. And of course, other ways too. But that connectivity from the ventral medial prefrontal cortex to the amygdala doesn't really happen until adolescence. Prior to adolescence, there's connectivity from the amygdala to the, the VMPFC, but not the other way around. So children tend to regulate themselves more with their caregivers, particularly their mother. Um, and that's more about touch. It's more neuroendocrine driven. They're running to the caregiver, and the caregiver provides the, the various cues and, and stimulates various biological processes that regulate the amygdala. It's when children, in, 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 this has been observed in rodents, monkeys, and humans so far, that um, around adolescence, that connectivity starts to kick in where, that, where we learn to regulate ourselves, the connectivity from the ventral medial prefrontal cortex to the amygdala. In children who have been abused, I'm sorry, children have been neglected, they develop this connectivity precociously. They learn to regulate themselves. They have precocious connectivity between the ventral medial prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. And that's kind of amazing that we can do that. And, but rodents can do it, and so can monkeys, so far as we know. But there's a, probably a cost to it. There, there's less flexibility. Because the reason that takes so long to develop, there's, it's, it, we don't fully understand this. I don't think anybody does. But there's the, the reason that, that that longer period of time of development allows for much richer neural connections to other brain regions, including, for example, the hippocampus, which allows us to determine which to, to, to read context. So um, one of the researchers told me that the, the, the precocious children she called them go, no, go kids, meaning that they almost have like an on-off switch. It's either threat or not threat. And there's very little gray area in between. Whereas in a more um, prolonged development, you develop a lot of connectivity to other regions and you have much more subtle ability to modulate stress. So the possibility is that flexibility, uh, the inflexibility occurs as a result of early life adversity or other experiences. And that would be something hugely important to know. But this is, this is where this fits into the broader picture. Um, I just want to thank all the people that have been paying for this research over the years. And thanks for sticking around and listening. Uh, I'm curious to know that when you are doing this study, what are some of the mechanisms that build in to um, really get the true response from the people who are um, who we study because of we know that sometimes people act differently when they're in front of people or when they are alone. Like people may smile during the day and they may cry at night. Uh, okay. How, how honest they are to the study. Thanks. Okay, it's a nice question. So you're kind of asking, if I can paraphrase it, you're asking um, how do we measure how people are actually functioning? Um, is that kind of what you're asking? The, how, how we know how people are functioning? Yeah. 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 Okay. 
Well, there's, okay, that's a great question. Now, initially when we began to do this, so the question is really how do we know we have 60% who are looking really healthy? How do we know they're really healthy and, and maybe we just got them on a good day? That would be quite a good day, I think, but um, this is a question we've asked, oh, sorry, one behind the pole. There's a question we've asked um, many times, uh, especially early on when we first began to do this research, it was fairly controversial because we were saying, we were coming up with findings that didn't really jibe with the, with the going idea that people, everybody's traumatized, everybody suffers from bereavement, everybody suffers grief. So it went out of our way in those early studies to try to validate these findings. So one of the first studies, the first one of the first studies we did were bereavement studies. And so we measured people. We had physiological measures as well. We had structured clinical interviews where we interviewed people for hours. Um, and in a structured clinical interview, you ask a lot of questions. You don't just get a self-report answer. And the, 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 the interviewer actually makes the rating based on a lot of different information. Then at one of those studies, we sent all of the participants, every single one, individually to a a self-identified grief therapist, expert grief therapist, who made independent ratings, and we showed that they were correlated. So we figured, all right, this person has been in, a, in like a four-hour interview. There had been some physiology. We sent them to a shrink, and the per, that person said they're okay too. And if they can do all that, you know, you can sit in, in with a therapist for an hour, and the therapist says you're, you're probably okay, that's pretty good. Um, then in other studies, we've also we've continued to do different things. So in some studies, we had people's friends make ratings about them anonymously. Um, and that, that turned out to also support the same type of findings. So their friends were given envelopes, um, and they were told that they, were, they mailed them back directly to us, and their friend, the, the person they were rating would never see it. And of course, they weren't allowed to ask about it. So we did those kind of things. And we've more recently started to do biological assessments as well. Um, so it, it's really, it, it's, it's still a good question. I, I appreciate your asking. We're still trying to, to, to look at those things to make sure we're doing this correctly. But yeah, so far, and over time, there have been so many different studies showing the same types of findings, so we're more and more confident. Yeah. With your um, <clears throat> military resiliency uh, study uh, regarding your sample, and I, I'm I assume based on what you said that um, these you you visit and revisit these uh, personnel uh, at varying times during their career. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So I, I'm wondering how you account for the question of what kind of combat exposure happens because inside of that population. Um, Inside of that population, there is an there's a reasonable expectation that there will inevitably be less, considerably less combat exposure as they get promoted and move away from the direct combat roles. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so so the question is, how do we work that out, or something along those lines? Yeah. So the step, the slide that I show you are all single deployers. One nice thing about having 140,000 soldiers already enrolled in a study, is you can pick exactly what you want um, without a sampling issue. So we're not, if you recruit only soldiers who've been s deployed once, then you have sampling bias, because they're coming to you. But if you have the sample already and then you pick what you want, you're, you're not sampling, you're just selecting the data. So we did this with single deployers and multiple deployers separately. And we found surprisingly similar trajectories. Um, that actually, the, the multiple deployers actually looked healthier. That flies in the face of the idea that multiple deployments wear us out. But I think in that case, we can explain that by the fact that people who stayed in the military multiple times were healthier. That's why they stayed. Um, so that it, the, no doubt that multiple deployments can really harm people. But on the whole, they're healthier, I think. Um, uh, and then we've now got four or five data analyses going with these data sets, looking at other things like when they left, when they didn't leave, et cetera. And so you, we account for all of those various techniques. Now, officers tend to do better than, than non-officers. I'm sorry. <laughs> There's a better word for that, and it just escapes me at the moment. Um, because officers have higher training, and they probably see less direct exposure. And, and the, the, the troops that are more on the ground, like the Army and the Marines, tend to have higher levels of, of distress and, and symptoms because they're more exposed. So we can, we've been looking at all those things. And there's nothing yet has been surprising in those things. It's a good question, though. Hello. Uh, 
I was just curious about the role of pharmaceuticals and how do you control for maybe antidepressants or anti-anxiety medications? Um, we haven't done a lot with that. Um, we probably could do better, but we, we, we measure it, but I don't know how good our measurements are. Um, is, there something, is there something specific you would wonder if, if we might see? or? When looking at the resilient, uh, yeah. like the line for the resilience, how many of those people are on maybe some kind of medication that's helping them cope with whether it's being a widow or having yeah. a heart attack? Well, that, that's, that's, that's interesting because I often get asked about that resilient group. Are they in therapy? Are they on pharmaceuticals? But and initially, I wondered about that when we were get, starting like you know, months after an event. But then the more recent, in a number of studies, and I've only showed you a few of them, we have now a number of studies where we're measuring people right at the time of the event. So either they're immediately going on, on pharmaceuticals or immediately getting the therapy that um, otherwise it's not a factor. It doesn't quite make sense because that they're just doing well. So they wouldn't need to have pharmaceuticals. The really interesting question, and I, I think following up your point, the really interesting question, I showed the slide um, of the trajectories in different colors on a black background early on. And when we look at you know, resilience is say 60%, 70%. That still leaves, and this, it, it kind of amazes me that there isn't more interest in this. That still leaves 30%, 40% of people who are doing really poorly initially. Some of them get better, some of them don't, and there's almost no study of those people. That's where you'd really want to look at pharmaceuticals. That's where you'd really want to look at intervention. There was one study that was done at NYU on an emergency room study where they only looked at the people who were doing really poorly, had high levels of PTSD symptoms, and they looked at intervention. And the intervention didn't actually say much about the trajectories, and that was kind of disappointing to those investigators. But those are crucial questions, absolutely crucial questions, and that's where you would want to do that. And pharmaceutical companies are now starting to look at these trajectories too because they can tell them about how people respond to the pharmaceuticals. So in your um, presentation, you um, talked about like a lot of people are resilient, and I have a question about race, ethnicity, gender. Like, do those um, identities or, or factors um, affect any, any yes. of this, or have you looked at that? Yeah, we have. It's a great question. the The, the answer might be a little surprising, but it makes sense. I think initially there was an idea that in the PTSD world, in the trauma world, that 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 um, uh, minority status typically predicted more PTSD symptoms. And it turns out, though, when in these kind of trajectory studies, we get much better parsing of the samples. When we've done it, the, those effects go away when you control for income and resources. And in this country, and I don't know, maybe everywhere in the world, resources and minority status differences tend to go hand in hand, right? So when you control for, for the resources, the resources are what drives the symptoms because resources is one of the things. When I showed you the slide with all the different predictors, there are several different resource variables on there, like not just income, but opportunities, not just education, but um, training. So the, and not just, health, not just good health, but availability of health care. When you start measuring all those things, those things do predict the outcomes. And those things tend to also be mixed up with minority status in this country and probably many other places too. So that's really the thing that drives it. And I, I, I think we don't pay much attention to that because that's expensive to fix. Hi. So uh, I've, I've always been interested in resilience. And I was wondering whether you came up across uh, anything in your research regarding any developmental characteristics that um, affect resilience. Now, because the only thing I know of is it's sort of like habituation. You get used to the trauma when it goes on for a long time. Yeah. Some people get resilient. But is there anything uh, that you sort of develop as a child that helps you become more resilient? Oh, OK. Um, I think of it, um, I'm sorry to do that, but I'm going to, I passed it. No, I didn't. I'm going to just go back. Yeah, here it is. Uh, oh. Yeah. No, all right. Um, so I, I put this up before. Um, I think this is an answer to your question. So there are a lot of, um, I showed you the, very quickly the, the biological s slides. But one of the key, so when we're, res first of all, I would say most of us are naturally resilient. And we think, I think it's better to think about it, what gets in the way, what sort of interferes with that process. 
in the, in the people who are now, and I'm careful about how I say that because I don't want to sound like people have, there's, there's a fault in somebody. But there are deficits that we have, and we know that. And I think they're largely epigenetic. There's some genetic findings, right, there's a, that account for some of the variability. There are all these things that explain some of the variability, but there's some very, very compelling findings right now with the HPA axis. So when we think about the stress response, we have this kind of one-two punch. We have an immediate response, the catecholamines and the fight-or-flight response, right? Um, and that is what we respond to immediately. And then the cortisol system and other neuroendocrine responses kick in. They take longer to, to kick in, but they're more powerful. And those are really the things that seem to make a big impact on how people cope with trauma. The HPA axis, the um, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. The receptors in the brain for cortisol um, have been, there have been lots of interesting findings about epigenetic um, factors in those receptors. So the receptors for cortisol are influenced, seem to be influenced by early childhood adversity. So people can be, have more or less regulatory control of the, of, the, of the cortisol, of the way we respond to cortisol in the brain. And that's, there have been several recent studies showing that now, that people with certain kinds of early life adversity, too much stress, um, for example, can again, hypersensitize or suppress that system um, epigenetically. And so those are very interesting and very important types of findings. Is that what you were asking about? Or? Yeah. Well, I think most of us, most of us acquire these things naturally. Um, and um, there, there's, there's a lot of, there's been some really good epidemiological work to show that exposure to lots of adversity, uh, to traumatic events, this only makes us, puts us at risk if we have trauma reactions to those events. But being exposed to those events and not having trauma reactions doesn't necessarily predict anything better. Because it's, I think the, 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 the resilience part actually comes fairly natural. This is, a, um, this is a hard sell, this idea that we're naturally resilient, because as resilience became more, more common, it sort of began to gradually replace the pathology model, not completely, never will. Um, but that led to a kind of a, I hope I don't offend anybody by saying this, it led to a little bit of an industry of resilience building. And that industry, if you look closely at what people are saying, they're actually espousing a model of human beings as very fragile and weak. You need to build resilience. You need to read these books. You need to do this program. I get a lot of this stuff in the mail. I don't know how they know my address, but I get this stuff in the mail. And I read it and I think, but this is implying that we're all fragile and weak, and in fact, the data show that most of us are, are actually just fine the way we are without any book or any training in this area because we have this inborn system. So I think that's a very different way to think about it, and it suggests some very different questions and some different answers. Yeah. I think we'll take that as the last question. Professor Bonanno, extraordinary work. Thank you. For Fantastic. Thank you all for, Thank for you. sticking around. Thank you so much. Really important, impressive, outstanding.